Hello, all, and uh, welcome to the Unified Science Review for May. Um, I'm William Brown, uh, scientist with the Resonance Science Foundation and uh, faculty for the Resonance Academy. Uh, I'm glad that you all could uh, join us for this review of some of the uh, latest advancements in the development of a science of uh, unified physics and uh, unified science in general. Uh, in this review, uh, we'll be looking at uh, some of the uh, latest research and uh, advancements that are bringing us closer to uh, a, a unified physics and unified science. Uh, in particular, today, uh, we're going to be looking at the topic of infinitely curved space-time geometries or singularities, or perhaps uh, the more popular term uh, as they're known, black holes. Albeit uh, the term uh, black hole is somewhat of a misnomer uh, because as we'll see today, uh, black holes are the brightest objects in the known universe. Uh, as quasars and active galactic nuclei. Uh, so it's another one of those uh, monikers in physics that kind of uh, has the opposite name of what it should, uh, kind of like uh, the vacuum. Uh, because uh, as we know, uh, the quantum vacuum, a uh, vacuum normally means uh, a space completely devoid of any substance or energy or form or anything like that. But we know that uh, the quantum vacuum uh, is the densest material uh, in the universe. Uh, it has uh, the, the vacuum state of space as a density of something like uh, on the order of uh, 10 to 93 grams per centimeter cube. Uh, so one of the most uh, 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 substances with one of the most uh, highest energy densities we call empty, a vacuum. <laughs> and uh, similarly, uh, black holes, um, which are normally uh, considered, like the name would suggest, a hole that something goes into and disappears and, you know, um, is black, so it's uh, devoid of any light. Uh, well, what we're going to look at today and what some of the most recent research is showing is that, in fact, uh, th this is absolutely not the case. Uh, black holes have tremendous energy emissions, uh, emissions uh, of light across the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, and are some of the uh, brightest objects in the known universe. Uh, so, this is kind of uh, a change in the what was the the kind of conventional predominant perspective of black holes is these devouring monsters. Instead, what we're going to see uh, is how they are much more like seeds of creation. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, let me just share my screen. Oh, and uh, I'm also uh, I'm coming to you from a uh, different location than normal. Uh, my lab uh, is actually um, packed up and I'm moving to a new location. So uh, the next couple uh, meetings, uh, I'll probably be coming to you from a, a somewhat different location than normal, if anybody was wondering about that. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we'll be looking at uh, the article uh, that was written by uh, myself, Dr. Inez Ordeneta, and Amal Pushup, an affiliate physicist with the Resonance Science Foundation. Uh, this is uh, Galactic Engines. Uh, so, let me see here. For over uh, 25 years, uh, physicist Nassim Haramein 
has been describing uh, intrinsic black holes as the organizational nuclei of physical systems across scale, from the micro to the cosmological. The reasoning is straightforward. Uh, black holes function as the organizational nucleus for organized matter because they are engines of mass energy generation and their spin, described by the hermann rauscher space-time metric, produces a highly coherent region of quantime, quantized space-time that has a specific ordering parameter. And this applies for organized matter across scale. Uh, we can see here uh, from one of our publications how you can plot uh, organized systems, organized matter across a very large range of scale. This is radius. And uh, when there is a singularity at the center, it falls very specifically along this trend line. This is uh, plotted as a function of uh, frequency. So uh, here at uh, the Planck scale, uh, 10 to negative 33 centimeters. And at the Planck frequency, you have the Planck black hole, uh, the Planck spherical unit, uh, and all the way at the other end, at close to 10 to the 30 centimeter radius, uh, you have the universe, which also obeys the uh, Schwarzschild uh, condition. Um, and it's uh, interesting that microtubules of Euclid Karyotic cells, which have a typical length of two times 10 to the negative eight centimeters and an estimated vibrational frequency of a billion to um, 10 to the 14 hertz, lie quite close to the line specified by the scaling law. And it would fall right here, intermediate between the Planck scale and the cosmological scale kind of uh, equidistant between the two. So um, within the last few decades, uh, in verification of this postulate uh, that um, black holes form the organizational nucleus uh, from uh, planets, stars, galaxies, and even the universe itself, um, uh, it's become widely acknowledged that black holes form the organizational nucleus for the, uh, the majority of galaxies in the universe. Uh, these black holes that are found at the center of most every galaxy are truly phenomenal systems. Unimagin unimaginably massive, uh, these are super massive black holes. So we're going to be looking uh, in some detail at supermassive black holes and the kind of uh, analysis that is being done now that we have uh, direct observations uh, of some of these supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies and the kind of um, revelations that are coming about uh, due to these direct analysis of these uh, supermassive black holes. Uh, some reaching several billion solar masses, where one solar mass is the mass of our sun. So these are truly uh, gargantuan, uh, uh, colossal uh, uh, systems, which is with uh, unimaginable energy. Uh, so in this uh, Unified Science Review, we'll be examining how the latest research has revealed the role of active galactic nuclei feedback dynamics in shaping the evolution and development of galaxies, such that supermassive black holes are no longer considered as uh, devouring destructive monsters, but as galactic engines of colossal power shaping the properties and characteristics of their respective galaxies. Uh, so, you know, not devouring monsters, <laughs> but actually uh, uh, galactic engines that are shaping 
some of the, the key properties and characteristics of galaxies and uh, much more, uh, as we'll see. So are black holes, not monsters, engines of creation? Black holes are the organizational nucleus for organized matter. And that's been one of our uh, key postulates in developing a unified physics. Um, and that, that's one of the reasons why we'll be looking at black holes in such uh, detail is that black holes are a key element in developing a unified physics and, and uh, uh, solving quantum gravity. Uh, and, and we'll discuss that in uh, some detail as uh, black holes uh, can are macroscopic quantum objects as well as microscopic relativistic objects. So they're uh, a, a key link between these two seemingly disparate regi regimes of physics, quantum mechanics, and general relativity. Uh, in this review, a key point that we will endeavor to elucidate is that uh, space-time singularities, vortices of infinite space-time curvature, also known as black holes, are the seeds of creation, uh, almost quite literally. Note uh, that this is in contrast to uh, the historically predominant perspective of black holes as voracious, purely destructive monsters. <laughs> Indeed, uh, to this day, you will hear black holes described as monsters. Uh, you could pull up uh, an article on black holes. It was published in the last week, and more likely than not, it will say something about a destructive monster. <laughs> Uh, but recent research is beginning to change this perspective, uh, even among uh, the the consensus scientific uh, community, among uh, um, conventional astrophysicists, that is coming to light uh, the uh, organizational role that black holes play in structuring the universe uh, and galactic systems, and therefore. Um, uh, stellar systems and, and uh, across scale or organizing matter. Uh, the foundation of the postulate of black holes as seeds of creation comes from understanding the formation and role of primordial black holes uh, in organizing matter across scale. Again, kind of hearkening back to that scaling law that we briefly looked at. Uh, and we'll be uh, looking at this in, in some more detail here. Uh, and for a big picture purview, I'll note that in addition to functioning as the organizational nucleus uh, for all organized matter, black holes and strong gravity in general uh, converts the energy potential of mass into electromagnetic energy. So strong gravity synthesizes multinucleon elements. Consequently, this process is requisite for the formation of life. Without this process, there would be no building blocks and no energy to form a living system. Uh, so, you know, talking about infinitely curved space-time geometries, or even just strongly curved space-time geometries, uh, it's this strong gravity uh, that is taking the energy potential of mass and converting it to light, electromagnetic energy, and in the process, building all the elements that form uh, living systems uh, and even uh, planets and uh, you know places for living systems to live. <laughs> uh, so, Again, kind of uh, the idea that th these are the seeds of creation. Uh, th this image here uh, is showing um, a, uh, a super giant star kind of at the end of its uh, life cycle. Uh, and uh, you can see that the myriad, uh, the, the number of uh, elements that are being formed within this star. 
and in the process it's giving off uh, light heat and energy uh and you know it's thought conventionally that at the center here there's this iron core and that's where uh thermonuclear fusion stops is at iron the element iron uh but actually what we're going to look at as well is that uh probably here at the center there is a black hole as well uh so um you know it's totally acknowledged that at the center of every galaxy there's a supermassive black hole soon what will be acknowledged possibly is that at the center of most every star there is a black hole So uh, supermassive black holes are truly uh, colossal uh, objects. Uh, so um, one of the largest, Ton 618, uh, has a mass of uh, up to 60 billion solar masses. Uh, and so black hole masses will be given in the unit of solar mass. That's equal to approximately uh, two times 10 to 30 kilograms. That's approximately the mass of the sun. Uh, so uh, th these here's a, a kind of a scale comparison of some of the largest supermassive black holes. And this ton 618 uh, is truly gargantuan. Uh, for comparison, the supermassive black hole at the Milky Way Center, Sagittarius I star, has a mass of approximately uh, a million solar masses, four times 10 to the six solar masses. Uh, and the uh, luminosity of this gargantuan is uh, four times 10 to the 40 watts, 140 trillion times that of the sun, uh, again, making it one of the most luminous objects in the known universe. Uh, and it has a, uh, the event horizon has a, a, radi a diameter up to 11 times the radius of our solar system. Uh, so um, I see a, a question that came up. Uh, how do you measure the mass of a black hole? Uh, the way that this is normally done is that you can see, especially with these supermassive black holes, at the center of the galaxy, uh, you can see uh, orbiting stars around the uh, central supermassive black hole. And uh, you can calculate uh, from their orbits and their speed, their velocities, uh, the mass of the uh, central supermassive black hole. So let me see if I can get this uh, video to play. Um, it's uh, the animation shows uh, 10 supersized black holes that, oh, uh, occupy center stage in their host galaxies. Uh, including the Milky Way and M87, scaled by the size of their shadows. The shadow of the black hole is thought to be uh, twice the size of the event horizon. So starting near the sun, we're slowly uh, pulling out. Um, The animation shows um, our own central uh, supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, uh, approximately 4.3 million suns. Uh, then we're going to see uh, two uh, gargantuan supermassive black holes in GC7727 
located about 1,600 light years apart. One weighs 6 million solar masses, another uh, about approximately 150 million suns. Uh, those will possibly merge in the next 250 million years or so. Uh, then um, we stop with uh, Ton 618. Uh, with a solar mass of approximately 60 billion solar masses. Uh, and um, its shadow is so large that a beam of light would take weeks to, ver to traverse it. Uh, so, you know, we can start to get an idea of the size of these uh, truly uh, colossal objects, these galactic engines. Um, the size and consistency of these supermassive black holes that are coming to light, uh, quite literally, are causing astrophysicists to re-examine and re reformulate many ideas about stellar and galaxy evolution. The first issue is that these incredibly large black holes form much too quickly and grow far too large to be accounted for by the uh, traditional model of star death and subsequent accretion of small black holes into larger black holes. For example, uh, 1 billion solar mass black holes have been observed in active galactic nuclei going back to just 690 million years after the so-called Big Bang. And um, I have discussed this uh, in this article, Astrophys Astrophysics Gets Turned on Its Head, Black Holes Come First, uh, with um, Dr. Amir Val Baker, um, you know, discussing how uh, now that we're beginning to see at some of the earliest epochs of the universe, uh, when we're looking back uh, 13 billion years almost, uh, one of the things you see is black holes, uh, quasars, uh, supermassive black holes. And, uh, you know, so they're, they're there much too early uh, to be accounted for by the, the normal kind of conventional uh, model where black holes are forming due to stellar collapse, uh, collapse of, of, star, of massive stars. So um, based on the conventional theories of black hole formation and growth via stellar death, uh, this far exceeds that of the expected mass of black holes uh, for that epoch in the universe's development. Uh, supermassive black holes at 690 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, conventionally, black hole masses at this stage in cosmic evolution are, are calculated to be only a few hundred solar masses following the ero previous erroneous models. Uh, note this predicted mass for the first black holes is based on the assumption that these seed black holes are remnants of the first stars, known as population three stars, uh, which were formed as a result of the primordial gas cooling when the universe was approximately uh, 200 million years old. However, uh, if black holes preceded the first stars, then they could not have formed from stellar collapse, as the conventional model describes for the formation of most black holes. Uh, so, you know, we're getting direct observational evidence of the uh, way that that traditional perspective is incorrect, that conventional model. Uh, and we're seeing that the black holes were there at the beginning, acting as uh, the seeds of creation. Uh, to describe the supermassive black holes that are observable today in almost every galaxy, with masses of millions to billions of solar masses, it is posited that the first black holes grew from direct gravitational collapse of large, extremely large uh, uh, gas nebulae, uh, hydrogen nebulae. However, we also must consider that the energy density of the early universe was extremely high. The amount of energy per unit volume of space in the earliest moments of the Big Bang were of the Planck density. So from this, uh, black holes would directly form. And these are called uh, primordial black holes. So uh, th this is showing uh, 
the conventional perspective, uh, the, uh, what, what was the kind of the traditional model of uh, early in the universe, uh, the death of the first stars, which were massive, uh, produced relatively small black holes, and that these merged uh, and grew via accretion and merging to form the uh, billion solar mass supermassive black holes that we observe today. Uh, but this model is just not comporting with observation. And so uh, the conventional model is now becoming much more that uh, you have direct collapse into black holes of, the, of these large gas clouds in the early universe. Uh, and so instead of your seeds being approximately 100 solar mass black holes, they're on the order of a thousand to tens of thousands of solar masses. And this matches much better uh, recent observation of uh, the uh, ubiquity of supermassive black holes uh, th that they're found in almost every galaxy and uh, some of these colossal sizes of millions to billions of uh, solar masses. Uh, and uh, what's more though, uh, you know, th this is the direct gravitational collapse model, uh, but it, it should also be recognized that uh, these, uh, the black holes, uh, primordial black holes could have formed directly uh, uh, from the Planck energy density at like the earliest uh, uh, periods following the Big Bang, uh, from like the Planck time to even just one second after uh, the Big Bang. So your kind of traditional model of many small mass black holes, relatively small mass black holes, forming in the early universe, accreting together. Uh, but And now the, the more uh, uh, precise perspective of direct collapse forming these uh, supermassive black holes. So uh, recent research updated from direct observation of black holes at the centers of galaxies and active galactic nuclei are causing a revision to the conception of black holes. And we see that they are the first objects to form in the early universe and act as seeds to the formation of structure and organized matter and continue to guide the evolution and development of, uh, the development of galaxies and galactic structures. That is, they are galactic engines. Um, and, uh, you, you know, this is uh, just exciting developments uh, for us at, at the Resonant Science Foundation because this has been one of our key postulates uh, for a, a long time now. And um, observation is coming to verify uh, the many of the, the, the models that we've been describing for 20 plus years. So the first, first stars that formed and became today's extant supermassive black holes were unimaginably enormous. Now, this is a, a highly salient new theory, because uh, just as Nassim had predicted that black holes would be found at the center of nearly every galaxy, acting as the organizational nucleus for galactic systems. And that was at a time when the idea was considered somewhat crazy, <laughs> a black hole at every the center of every galaxy, but has now been verified. Uh, He's also posited that lower mass black holes could function in a fractally similar way to form the organ organizational nucleus for stars. Again, at the present time, this idea may seem somewhat uh, ludicrous to the conventional astrophysicists. Uh, yet already, this idea is being applied to explain the observation of supermassive black holes. And that is... Uh, via the idea of the quasi-star. A star with a black hole at its center. So uh, some it's it's becoming part of uh, kind of conventional theory 
that uh, the first stars, in fact, uh, had a black hole at their center. Uh, so um, it's, it's posited that the first stars grew from primordial or intrinsic black holes. Uh, these quasi stars, as they are called, were not powered by thermonuclear fusion uh, alone, although that, that could have been occurring. But um, so within convention, since it, 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 they're not following that normal model for what a star is, where you know it's shining because of thermonuclear fusion, that they're not called real stars. <laughs> they're called quasi stars. Uh, they they look and behave like stars, but because they have a black hole at their center, they're not real stars. Uh, so that uh, idea will probably need some revision as time goes on. But, you know, the uh, astrophysicists are coming to the understanding of the organizational structure of stars, which are following a fractal pattern uh, that you can see as at the same organizational parameters for galaxies with a supermassive black hole at the center acting as the organizational nucleus. So uh, these uh, quasi stars, as they're called, uh, eventually grew to truly massive proportions. And so they're visible today across billions of parsecs of space time as quasars. Again, quasi stellar objects. <laughs> Things that, that look like stars but are not stars. Uh, those are, but our quasars are the beacons at the dawn of time that shine with the strength of uh, billions of stars, and which are generally referred to as uh, active galactic nuclei. AGN is the acronym. So currently, the best way to account for supermassive black holes at the center of most every galaxy which defies previous conventional understanding of how black holes form and grow, is to posit that the force, first stars to form had primordial black holes at their center. These would eventually grow to become today's extant supermassive black holes. However, this process is still not entirely understood by conventional astrophysics. Uh, and still largely ne neglects that uh, in the high energy density of the early universe, Black holes were formed across a range of sizes and masses, what I like to call intrinsic black holes, but which are uh, more commonly referred to as primordial black holes. So uh, when we're looking at some of the, the earliest epoch of the universe, as it is conventionally thought, you know, with uh, the so-called uh, Big Bang, you know, which we we describe some of the 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 details of exactly what that event was, um, and you, you know, so um, not that that was the start of anything of the start of everything necessarily, uh, you know, but much more part of a, a cyclical process. Uh, but at some of the earliest moments following the Big Bang, uh, here's 10 to the negative 32 seconds going to one second, uh, the uh, energy density was at the, the Planck density, uh, which is the, the energy density of the vacuum state of space. Uh, but th this, uh, but you know, th th that's kind of the, the um, implicate order to follow the terminology of uh, physicist uh, David Bohm, uh, here it was much more the explicate order uh, that um, uh, across, uh, you, you know, it wasn't just at the Planck scale that you had these energy densities uh, because the universe was at the Planck scale. It was at the Planck density. Uh, so pressures and densities were so high that space-time itself folded and meshed into a multiply connected space-time geometry of micro wormholes, black hole, white hole systems. Uh, this is what we call the space memory network. So uh, in the very first moments, of the Big Bang, you had the formation of the space memory network. Uh, this is a, a figure from 
our paper, uh, the Unified Space Memory Network. Um, and it was formed uh, via when these uh, intrinsic black holes, primordial black holes, and which are follow a, a wormhole metric, uh, were first initially uh, formed. And so, you know, just uh, a little bit more detail on, you know, when we talk about the Big Bang, uh, we have a model uh, in which uh, that actually initiates as a proton escapes the event horizon of a parallel universe. So we're talking about the multiverse here. Uh, and because it's a, a fractal system, it's kind of like Russian nesting dolls. Uh, as that proton escapes, it has the holographic mass equivalent to 10 to the 55 grams, which is the mass of the observable universe. Uh, so in this different uh, pressure regime of, the of a larger universe, it rapidly expands. This is called like inflation, uh, but that uh, uh, Planck energy density uh, becomes a multiply connected uh, space-time geometry of uh, micro wormholes, uh, and that is the space memory network. Uh, and so th this has some uh, relevance to some of our previous unified science reviews uh, where we were talking about the intrinsic entanglement of space-time arising from micro wormhole connections, a micro wormhole network, uh, and how that was used for uh, quantum energy teleportation, um, as well as uh, uh, teleport teleporting uh, qubits. But uh, we can see here, just real briefly, uh, the mathematics uh, for this process. Uh, so, um, primordial black holes smaller than a solar mass formed in the early universe, uh, where the density is defined by this equation, rho equals one over g uh, for any given time squared. This is the um, gravitational constant. Um, and so we, we, we have units of uh, mass, uh, um, meters, kilograms, seconds. Uh, so um, that will give us a density. Uh, for any time uh, following the initial Big Bang. So this is the density here two, equation two. This is the density required in a region of space to form an event horizon. So this is like the uh, the Schwarzschild condition within Einstein field equations for general relativity. Uh, this is the, the density required for a black hole to form. Uh, so we can calculate the mass of a primordial black hole forming at any time following the Big Bang uh, via this density requirement. So um, at, let's say, a time of the Planck time, 10 to the negative 43 seconds, uh, we can plug that into... Uh, our equation here for the mass uh, of uh, something satisfying the, the Schwarzschild condition, a black primordial black hole forming at the uh, Planck density. And uh, what we have is at the Planck time, uh, the mass of the black holes forming are of the Planck mass. 10 to the negative five grams. Uh, so if you're familiar with the um, holographic solution uh, for uh, quantum gravity, uh, these are the Planck spherical units. They formed uh, at the Planck second, the Planck time 
following uh, the Big Bang. So uh, they were the, the first things to form in the early universe. Uh, and then uh, as these uh, formed into uh, higher order structures, they formed uh, protons, hadrons, uh, nucleons, uh, the center of the nucleus of atoms. Now, at a time of one second, if we plug that into our equation three here, uh, primordial black holes would have a mass of 10,000 solar masses, approximately 10 to 38 grams. Uh, so the supermassive black holes formed uh, one second after the Big Bang, essentially, as primordial black holes. And so that kind of raises the idea that black holes must be everywhere. <laughs> now, if uh, you follow our model, uh, where every proton is a black hole, hence every atom is a black hole, this is indeed correct. Uh, black holes are everywhere. Uh, so, but, um, you know, the, the, the fact that primordial black holes should be forming following those equations that we saw, uh, you know, even within kind of uh, conventional theory, it's understood that, well, there should be primordial black holes and probably everywhere. So it kind of has astrophysicists scratching their head. Uh, wh why don't we see these uh, primordial black holes everywhere? And it's kind of led to the idea that, well, maybe something's wrong with our uh, understanding of the, the first second after the Big Bang, uh, since you know quantum gravity isn't a model that's fully understood yet. Uh, but you know what we're saying is there's nothing wrong uh, with that model. Uh, the primordial black holes formed, uh, and they are everywhere. <laughs> um, so uh, you know hadrons are intrinsic, or if you like, primordial black holes. Uh, black holes above the Planck mass. Uh, but below stellar mass probably form the organizational nucleus for relatively small mass objects like planets and stars. Uh, while our postulation for microscopic black holes being the organizational nucleus for atoms, planets, and stars is considered somewhat radical by today's standards, uh, conventional astrophysicists are already working backwards to this scale, acknowledging the presence of supermassive black holes at the center of almost uh, every galaxy. Uh, and searching for 10,000 solar mass black holes at the center of large star clusters. So, you know, we're talking about that fractal organizational structure. Uh, so, you know, astrophysicists see they're, they're at the center of every galaxy. Now they're looking at the center of some of the largest star clusters. Kind of with that same fractal organization, there should be a relatively large mass black hole at the center of star clusters and acting as a, a uh, engine of creation guiding the uh, rate of star formation uh, in those star clusters and organizing that, that system. Uh, this will complete the fractal organizational structure. Once uh, the ultramassive black hole at the great attractor for the galactic superclusters discovered, and once it's acknowledged that the universe is a black hole because it obeys the, the sparse shield condition, uh, we have black holes at the center of every galaxy. Then once it's understood that we have it at the center of uh, star clusters, at the center of stars, planets, and nucleons, uh, that scaling law for organized matter will be complete. Uh, and, you know, it'll be understood how black holes are the organizational nucleus for organized matter uh, in the universe. Uh, a unification across scale. They are the unifying link, the key link, and the link for uh, quantum gravity. Uh, even our cells and our body can have a kind of holographic singularity point that forms that organizational nucleus for the system, uh, something that we explore in our biophysics research. <laughs> So, uh, so some of what I've discussed uh, 
will seem radical <laughs> to many, uh, to ma especially to many physicists and astrophysicists. But here is uh, a pretty famous physicist, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, discussing exactly what I just said. Uh, so uh, he's talking about uh, gravitationally collapsed objects, black holes, of a mass of the Planck mass to negative five grams upwards, which were, were formed as a result of fluctuations in the early universe, the, the Planck energy density. Uh, they would carry an electric charge of up to uh, plus or minus 30 electron units. Such objects would produce distinctive tracks and bubble chambers and could form atoms with orbiting electrons or protons. So no, uh, Hawking, is describing how primordial black holes or intrinsic black holes could act as the nucleus of atoms and would, for all intents and purposes, form stable atoms. Well, that's not too far of a uh, leap from, uh, you know, what we're describing as every hadron is a black hole. Uh, uh, atoms are the... Uh, uh, the, the nucleus of atoms are black holes. And that's what he's uh, suggesting here, that primordial black holes uh, would form stable atoms. Um, a mass of 10 to the 17 grams of such objects could have accumulated at the center of a star like the sun. So Stephen Hawking is uh, saying how we should expect or anticipate to see black holes at the center of stars. And again, that's uh, one of our uh, key postulates. Uh, th th this uh, image here, uh, this is actually from another article that I wrote some time ago, uh, where discussing how uh, stellar mass black holes are essentially gravitational atoms, macroscopic atoms. Uh, so, you know, uh, what we call atoms uh, are, are gravitationally bound particle-like objects. And so, um, you know, as suggested by Hawking, uh, black holes could be at the center of most, most every star. And so uh, that's something we've discussed is uh, in conventional model of star formation. You have just... Uh, so something um, triggers the collapse of a stellar nebula, a hydrogen gas cloud. Um, and with a massive star, it goes through this cycle and forms a black hole. More likely, what you have is that a primordial black hole acts as the accretion nucleus for this hydrogen gas cloud, this nebula. Uh, and uh, that is what triggers the formation of this organized system, the massive star. And, uh, you know, it, it can go through the normal cycle of synthesizing uh, those uh, uh, um, multi-nucleon elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, you know, things pretty essential for life in the living system. Uh, and the supernova that produce the heavy elements, heavier than iron. Uh, but it's not so much that the, the black hole is formed during the during the, the, the death cycle, so-called death cycle of this star. It's just that uh, that hydrogen gas was fully converted into heavier elements, metals, uh, and the central black hole is then revealed, the central black hole that was always there. And this could go on uh, to trigger another cycle. If it goes into another uh, hydrogen gas cloud, form another massive star and re repeat the cycle. That is, it is a, a seed of creation. Now, uh, a key consideration in all of this is that black holes uh, as intrinsically quantum macroscopic objects and microscopic relativistic objects are a key link in unifying physics, that is uh, quantum mechanics or quantum field theory and general relativity, as they are the link between 
microphysics and macrophysics. Microscopic black holes do not obey the classical Einstein equations, even if their radius is huge compared to the Planck scale. They are in the quantum gravitational regime because the energy density is Planckian. Again, following the same reasoning as Hawking, uh, here, Carr um, points out that the, the very obvious fact that elementary particles can be interpreted as subplanking black holes. So he says, uh, all black holes are in some sense quantum, and that elementary particles can be interpreted as subplanking black holes. So there's this uh, subtle connection between quantum and classical physics. Uh, here we have a radius uh, plotted against mass, uh, and we see the classical division uh, between the quantum and relativistic domains. So you know this is where we talk about unified physics. We want to unify these seemingly two disparate domains, our relativistic domain and our quantum domain, which, uh, you know, in, in current uh, conventional physics uh, are split in two, uh, irreconcilable, seemingly. Well, we can see here in this diagram that they have a union here at the Planck scale, where the uh, Schwarzschild radius is equal to the Compton wavelength. That's a Planck mass black hole, what we also call a Planck spherical unit. Uh, as we go to the right, at large mass and small radius, we are in the quantum gravitational regime. And this is where primordial black holes reside. Uh, however, considering our model in the holographic mass solution, where hadrons are intrinsic black holes, or primordial black holes, if you like, uh, we have the intrinsic unification of physics because elementary particles are in the quantum gravitational regime. So uh, we're here, if we're following this diagram, we're here in the quantum gravity domain. It's just not acknowledged yet that we're there. Uh, and so that's how we get to uh, a unified physics. The wide range of masses of black holes and their crucial role in linking macrophysics and microphysics uh, is summarized here in uh, figure one from uh, one of Carr's papers. Uh, and this shows the uh, cosmic Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail, uh, with the various scales of structure in the universe indicated along the side. Uh, so here is uh, some of the largest scales, some of the largest cosmological scales over here, we're at the universal scale, uh, quasi-stellar objects, quasars, um, massive black holes, stellar objects, planets, mountains, people, cells here, viruses, DNA, atoms, uh, the so-called Higgs boson, uh, and then going into the Planck scale, and we're here at the Planck mass, uh, the, so the Planck black hole at the other end. But again, here, between those two, you have the grand unification theory. Uh, so um, this is where those two are unified in this diagram. Uh, the larger scale and the small scale are, are unified. So it can be regarded as a sort of clock in which the scale changes by a factor of 10 for each minute. Uh, from the Planck scale at the top left uh, to the scale of the observable universe uh, at the top right. 
uh, the head meets the tail at the Big Bang because uh, at the horizon distance, one is peering back to an epoch when the universe was very small. Uh, so the very large meets the very small there. And that's what we were discussing. Uh, that's Those were the conditions where primordial black holes formed at the Planck time and one second uh, after uh, the Big Bang. Uh, the various types of black holes discussed uh, in this figure are indicated on the outside of the Ouroboros. Uh, even uh, planetary mass black holes, uh, Planck mass black holes, and extra dimensions. It provides a convenient division between the microphysical and macrophysical domains. Although the link scale lambda uh, decreases as one approaches the top of the Ouroboros from the left, the mass of the associated particle increases, which is interesting. So, uh, you know, within conventional theory, uh, the proton has a smaller mass than uh, the Planck spherical unit. But we know that the holographic mass of the proton is much greater than that. You know, it's just not directly observed because of uh, relativistic Lorentz contractions, uh, mass dilation, that, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a screening of the true mass of the proton. Um, so uh, this can also be used to represent uh, elementary particles. Uh, on the left side of the Ouroboros here are indicated the positions of uh, you know, the Higgs boson and proton. Uh, and the dark energy uh, scale, dark energy mass scale, at the bottom, and uh, the mass limit of the graviton at the top. Uh, note that the inner scale also gives the temperature of a black hole with mass indicated on the outer scale. Um, now, Carr indicates that primordial black holes or black holes uh, at this scale, their temperature, they would be exploding. Uh, and that comes from the calculations of uh, from the Hawking radiation temperature of these small black holes. Uh, the Hawking radiation temperature is inversely related uh, to the radius or mass of the black hole. So the larger the black hole, the lower the Hawking radiation temperature. The smaller the black hole, the greater. And so when you're in, in the quantum domain at the atomic scale and below, uh, it's thought that these primordial black holes would just explode. And that's another reason why conventionally uh, physicists and astrophysicists uh, don't believe that uh, primordial black holes formed because uh, following the somewhat erroneous model, they believe that they would have exploded almost instantly or they would be exploding now all around us. And note as well, though, that uh, the equidistant central location of the biological system uh, it's it's right here, uh, almost nearly completely equidistant from the smallest scale and the largest scale, which is a fairly interesting positioning here. Uh, so it's it's another reason why we think there are holographic black hole dynamics at play within the cellular system, acting as a link or information conduit between the micro and macro scales. Uh, so, you know, if you're talking about why are we here, what is the purpose of life? In a way, the living system uh, is the informational conduit between the micro and macro scale, linking it all together. Uh, so, uh, this is talking about the formation of primordial black holes. This is from the same paper with Carr. Uh, and he's talking about um, black holes uh, uh, smaller uh, than about 10 to the 15 grams are quantum black holes. Although he says, I will argue, argue later that all black holes are in a sense quantum. Those smaller than a lunar mass, 10 to the 24 grams, will be classified as microscopic since their size is less than a micron.
However, he's saying, though, that those initially lighter than that 10 to the 15 grams, so our quantum or microscopic black holes, smaller than a proton, uh, you know, he's saying that they would have evaporated by now due to Hawking radiation uh, and gives uh, actually the, the equation where you can see that um, Hawking's calculations suggest that, that these quantum scale black holes or micro black holes uh, should almost instantly <laughs> evaporate in a quite explosive manner. Uh, but uh, this is not necessarily the case, and we'll see why. Uh, but And he, he does elucidate on this a little bit. Uh, a theory of quantum gravity be, would be required to understand the evaporation process as the black hole falls behind uh, uh, mass, falls to the Planck mass. And this might even allow stable Planck mass relics. Um, Carr uh, goes on to uh, discuss how the, uh, the existence of extra spatial dimensions beyond the three macroscopic ones may also come into play on creating uh, stable uh, primordial black holes, quantum black holes, microscopic black holes. Uh, and uh, they, you know, with as we develop uh, a a more understood theory of quantum gravity, uh, it opens up the possibility of terra electron volt quantum gravity and black hole production at accelerators. But what that would really just mean is uh, hadronization or forming protons, hadrons. Uh, but indeed, uh, you know, the, the idea that quantum black holes or, or microscopic black holes would immediately uh, evaporate in an in energetic explosion uh, is erroneous uh, for a number of reasons. But even most simply, uh, just that, you know, th these are relativistic objects as well, microscopic relativistic objects. So you have uh, relativistic effects like Lorentz contractions, which include um, mass dilation and uh, time dilation. Uh, so, um, you know, while it's common to discount the, the existence of microscopic black holes because the Hawking radiation pressure is inversely related to the mass, so stellar mass and substellar mass black holes are explosive, uh, that is only from their proper frame of reference. Uh, from a distance, the time dilation makes them appear ultra-stable. Uh, black holes were originally called uh, frozen stars, you know. Uh, so from relativistic time dilation, micro black holes are somewhat frozen in time. Um, but, you know, so, so that's just even given, uh, considering non-unified physics. So general relativity itself says that our quantum black holes uh, will uh, appear from our space-time frame of reference, essentially frozen in time, so ultra-stable. And indeed, you know, a proton has never been observed to decay. Although from their own proper frame of reference, if you were to follow the canonical Hawking equations, they're exploding. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, th th this is showing that kind of uh, time dilation here when you're getting at these uh, 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 radius, uh, at the, the quantum scale. Uh, this is actually from a paper called uh, uh, Planck Stars, uh, which is a good paper on uh, quantum gravity uh, and why uh, black holes don't necessarily form uh, the traditional kind of idea of a singularity, but instead uh, are stabilized at the Planck density from uh, collapsing further. So how can we apply this understanding uh, or primordial black holes, black holes forming force first acting as the seeds of creation? Uh, it's now firmly established that supermassive black holes reside at the center of most every galaxy and shape many of the observable characteristics, uh, such as the glow of the central bulge, the composition of the galactic halo, and the jets observed emanating uh, from some quasars. 
Uh, this was uh, th th these characteristics were first pointed out by uh, the United Kingdom's uh, astronomer uh, Martin Rees, um, who also has uh, published some really interesting papers with uh, Bernard Carr that we were just looking at. Um, and so uh, early on, he was pointing out that, you know, the, these jets, these extremely bright uh, um, central bulges of galaxies, uh, and even the, the composition and nature of the galactic halo uh, are probably the result of the activity of a supermassive black hole at the center. Um, and just uh, an interesting aside, uh, in my article, The Rotating Universe, uh, there's this very interesting observation where those jets from these quasars are, have a very strong correlation across uh, parsec and even uh, megaparsec distances. Uh, and so, you know, this is uh, quite a surprising finding that these jets of these quasars are aligned and strongly correlated. Um, and, you know, what could cause such strong correlation? Well, uh, you know, one reason is that um, just as the, uh, at the Planck scale, you have a multiply connected space-time geometry, a micro wormhole network, at, it's a fractal organization. So at the larger scale, here at the cosmological scale, you have a multiply connected space-time geometry, uh, a, a macro wormhole network. Uh, so, uh, you know, these supermassive black holes, they obey a wormhole metric. They are wormholes. Uh, so these are probably connected via Einstein-Rosen bridges. And you can see that strong correlation uh, via their whole alignment. Uh, and as well, uh, if you have a rotational component of the universe, that is a coherence generating dynamic angular momentum uh, that that will cause uh, poles to align as well. So this could be evidence of um, a larger rotation uh, of the universe itself. Uh, galaxy size is correlated to the size of the uh, supermassive black hole in the galactic nucleus. Uh, the more massive a galaxy is, the heavier its central black hole. Uh, so no black hole, and you have these little, tiny uh, galaxies, dwarf galaxies even. Uh, so you need a black hole to form a galaxy in, in some, in, in many senses, uh, in many regards. Uh, and the the larger that central supermassive black hole, uh, the larger the galaxy, uh, the host galaxy. Uh, so, you know, that's a pretty direct correlation, and it's a very direct indication that uh, the evolution and development of the galaxy is a result of that galactic engine at the center, the supermassive black hole. Uh, even uh, the presence and prevalence of life within a galaxy is possibly regulated by these active galactic nuclei. Uh, astronomer uh, Avi Loeb, uh, has performed calculations for the probability of dispersion of bioorganisms via galactic panspermia. A process that seeds the galaxy with terrestrial planets and potentially living organisms. Uh, he notes, so he, he's done uh, calculations on the survival time of extremophile organisms on uh, dispersed uh, terrestrial objects, life-bearing objects traveling with velocities greater, greater than 100 kilometers per second. Uh, he notes, though, in particular, interactions in the galactic center between the supermassive black hole and a stellar binary can accelerate stars to thousands of kilometers per second. And it's been shown that the same mechanism can accelerate planets up to tens of thousands of kilometers per second. 
Assuming planetary systems have asteroids and comets, dynamical interactions with the black holes can eject them at extreme velocities, and thus they may traverse the entire radius of the Milky Way in a million years, approximately. Such hypervelocity objects can become intergalactic. However, the capture probability for an intergalactic object is extremely low. If bacteria and other possible extremophiles have sufficiently long survival times, the galactic center can act as an engine for panspermia and seed the entire galaxy. Uh, so we're not just talking about, uh, you know, regulating the brightness of the central bulge and properties of the galactic halo and uh, matter and energy emission via the polar jets. Uh, the galactic nucleus, the, the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, uh, is probably one of the main engines seeding the galaxy with life, uh, galactic panspermia. Um, and he, his team has done some really uh, phenomenal calculations uh, for this, uh, where um, calculating uh, the, the speed of these inter stellar intergalactic objects um, dispersed via the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy uh, and uh, the the capture rate as a function of their velocity, a higher velocity, lower potential capture rate, as well as uh, as a function of the survival time, potential survival time of living organisms on these uh, terrestrial objects that are dispersed uh, through the galaxy. Um, but it's based on his team's calculations, it's totally probable uh, that many planetary systems are seeded with life via dispersion of life-bearing terrestrial objects from the galactic center. And, you know, uh, j just as a note, um, uh, the, the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, uh, it, it has a habitable zone around it where planets, terrestrial planets, uh, can will have liquid water. Uh, the, the only difference with a, the habitable zone of a supermassive black hole and that of a regular star is that the habitable zone of a supermassive black hole can host a million planets because <laughs> it's that large. Uh, so a, a million planets in stable orbit around the supermassive black hole. So, you know, these are, are interesting considerations when we're talking about the seeds of creation and galactic engines. Now, uh, the supermassive black holes uh, are even uh, coming to be understood to, to uh, determine the rate of formation of uh, new stars. Uh, material from the dense central core is fed into the uh, uh, center, and the black hole emits in spectacular fashion the energized material in thousands of light year long active galactic nuclei jets that form massive bubbles in the halo and recirculate into the galaxy. And so that's uh, kind of a, a key point here is that, you know, that term black hole, you know, that things are just getting sucked in and devoured and destroyed. Well, you know, what has come to light and what we're observing and seeing is that, uh, you no, know, there's a feedback feed forward dynamic. Uh, and so material is being uh, accreted into uh, highly organized structures, torus uh, uh, around the central massive black hole, but you also have emission, high energy emission of material back into the galaxy. And uh, that emitted material is doing many things, one of which is triggering new star formation in the galaxy. Uh, so what's been observed is a correlation between the activity of the supermassive black hole, the active galactic nucleus, and the, uh, in a sense, vitality of the galaxy, the, uh, the um, youthfulness of the galaxy. Um, with with uh, highly active galactic nuclei, you have many new stars forming in the galaxy. It's very active and dynamic. Uh, once this process is start, started to get towards the end of the life cycle, uh, and actually this uh, corresponds to very large galaxies, very elliptical galaxies that are very large and 
uh, billion mass, supermassive black holes at the center, uh, what you actually see is very low rate of new star formation. Most stars in those galaxies are very old. It's, they're called red and dead. Uh, just because uh, that feedback mechanism uh, from the central supermassive black hole is slowed down uh, and it's not triggering at, at the same rate uh, new star formation. Uh, and this is uh, discussed in some detail by uh, Dr. Inez Ordineta, evidence of black holes forming galaxies is mounting. Um, just with the James Webb Space Telescope and uh, direct observations that are occurring now, uh, we see very directly how the supermassive black holes are forming galaxies, uh, are the, uh, the, the, um, determining the evolution and development uh, and rate of formation of galaxies. And so this is uh, one of those somewhat direct images of our own uh, supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, Sagittarius I star. Uh, now, um, this uh, is a composite image. Uh, so, you know, this was um, put together uh, from, from several detections. Uh, so, you know, it's it's not exactly a direct image, not like you could look through a telescope and see this, uh, because, you know, this is uh, very far away, something like 26,000 light years away. And it's relatively small for that large of a distance, uh, something like, I think, the, the diameter of the orbit of Mercury. Uh, but uh, the way that this image was captured is really remarkable. Uh, you know, it's using uh, radio telescopes uh, positioned across the planet, uh, and they're able to take in uh, those those radio wavelength light sources and compile them together at different locations across the planet, such that uh, the, the diameter of the radio telescope is the diameter of the uh, the Earth. That they turn the Earth into the objective lens of this telescope, essentially to capture this image. Uh, but because it's kind of compiled, I do have some questions about, um, you know, uh, how much editing was done in compiling those images. Uh, you know, is this uh, how uh, you know direct uh, an image this is? Uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, it's definitely detecting light from our own supermassive uh, black hole at the center of our galaxy. And, um, you know, with this kind of image, with these kind of uh, uh, images that are being taken of our own supermassive black hole and others and other galaxies, uh, you can begin to do direct analysis of uh, the supermassive black hole. Um, and indeed, you know, uh, what had already been done is, you know, when you see the stars that you can detect uh, orbiting around this and you see their velocity, you can calculate the mass of the black hole at the center here. Uh, but, you know, with the brightness of like the uh, accretion disk around uh, Sagittarius I star, uh, you can see, okay, what's the rate at which it's accreting material forming that compact torus around it? Um, and actually, uh, with some of the more most recent analysis that's been done, uh, astrophysicists were somewhat surprised that uh, the the rate of ma material going into Sagittarius I star uh, is just a trickle. There's only a really uh, small amount of material going in to the black hole, so the the accretion disk is is relatively uh, quiescent. Uh, so. Um, you know, it's it's already um, you know, you know raising those questions. Uh, do do we as astrophysicists really understand what these objects are? Because you know they're supposed to be just the voracious devouring monsters just sucking everything in. But here you have a very slow regulated. They call it a. They literally called it a trickle of material coming in uh, to the supermassive black hole. Uh, but you also have uh, a lot of evidence of, of relatively recent uh, events of uh, activity where you have that feedback process where the central uh, supermassive black hole is feeding material out into the galactic halo 
uh, and the galaxy itself. Uh, just another uh, interesting note, um, you know, th this structure uh, is formed uh, from relativistic effects. Uh, so like the top part uh, is oftentimes, depending on your perspective orientation with the supermassive black hole, it's the accretion disk behind the black hole. Uh, gravitational lensing causes it to form this ring around it. Uh, and uh, if there's a tilt at all relative to your, your viewing perspective, you get uh, um, relativistic boosting of some of the light, uh, where it, the Doppler boosting, where um, it, it'll either appear, it, depending on the orientation of the tilt, uh, the light will be more or less luminous than it really is uh, due to the, some of these uh, relativistic effects. And, and just, you know, more ways that you know you're looking at a supermassive black hole uh, when you have these kind of relativistic effects occurring. Uh, supermassive black holes undergo cycles of high activity, becoming active galactic nuclei. Uh, the nuclei of active galaxies are the most powerful, long-lived sources of radiation in the universe. They often outshine the host galaxy in which they reside and are able to eject outflows or jets of relativistic plasma that emit all the way uh, from radio waves to the highest energetic gamma rays. To understand the mechanisms that govern active galactic nuclei, we have to go down to parsec or subparsec scales where a central engine formed by the supermassive black hole and the surrounding accretion disk produces uh, helical magnetic fields in which jets are thought to originate. See the jets coming out of this uh, active galactic nuclei here. Uh, the exact role of the magnetic field and its structure, the composition dynamics of the ejected jets, as well as the feedback effect of the jets on the gas and dust that surrounds the central engine are, however, still far from understood. Um, at present, the conventional model, conventional models uh, cannot very well account for what they're seeing, what's being described here. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, so it's, it's coming to light that, that you have this feedback feed forward dynamic and the active galactic nuclei is shaping the galaxy. It's uh, acting as a galactic engine. Uh, but the dynamics underlying that are not really understood. What's regulating the inflow of material into the accretion disk? What is regulating periods of activity and quiescence? Um, what, what is regulating uh, the, the amount of material that's being emitted into the galaxy and triggering new star formation and these kind of things? Uh, these, these are all at present kind of open questions. But uh you know dynamics that we uh can that we just uh, explain and one of the key pieces in explaining that is understanding uh the uh Planck plasma the quantum vacuum energy density um and we'll get it discuss that a little bit in uh, the conclusion here uh but um you know it's it's just seeing that uh something turns on these supermassive black holes uh, and they become these active galactic nuclei and it's just the most uh, energetic events um, occurring in the universe. But probably the only thing on par is uh, supernova, supernovae. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of these images that are being uh, gathered are just truly uh, spectacular of, uh, you know, th th this is showing the emission jets coming from this supermassive black hole in this particular galaxy. So the cycles of high activity of the active galactic nuclei shape the host galaxy. Um, and uh, these extant galactic structures are clear evidence of extremely high energy massive events, yet astrophysicists are trying to explain them, or were trying to explain them via purely stellar processes. Uh, so, um, th and th this particular one, these, these are called the Fermi lobes, 
uh, detected in our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and um, uh, there was a, a study published fairly recently on uh, these huge galactic structures uh, emitted, thought to be emitted by our supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, uh, and that they were emitted relatively recently, uh, something like in the last uh, 250 million years. So our own supermassive black hole was undergoing this active galactic nuclei phase uh, fairly recently. Um, new modeling and simulation results uh, published in Nature Astrophysics this past spring have shown that uh, the giant lobes uh, here uh, formed within uh, 2.6 million years, uh, far too quickly to be explained by stellar feedback. Uh, the feedback mechanism must involve the central supermassive black hole, not stellar processes, as was attempting to be described. Um, it, it, this, these are formed via what's called active galactic nuclei feedback, AGN feedback. Uh, yeah, I think I said 250 million years, 2.6 million years ago, uh, th these formed. So relatively recently, 250 million years would be uh, quite a long time ago, actually. <laughs> uh, what these observations show is the key importance of feedback feedforward processes, uh, a dynamic that we have discussed the significance of in great detail. Uh, for instance, in uh, our paper, The Unified Space Memory Network, uh, integrally uh, involving the relatively small singularity at center, uh, the, the feedback feed forward processes um, uh, uh, is important uh, to understand how this is occurring across relatively large distances in scale. Uh, so, you know, in the case of our galaxy, we're talking about an approximately uh, four megasolar mass black hole directing the 1.5 trillion uh, solar mass galaxy in the case of the Milky Way. Um, a dynamic that many scientists struggle to understand as these are interactions between such disparate scales. You know, approximately four million mass solar mass black hole directing the behavior of a 1.5 trillion solar mass galaxy. Uh, you know, that's that's some very strong coupling that is occurring to have that kind of uh, feedback dynamic occurring across such large uh, scale differences. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the Planck to the atomic scale, uh, the significance of the interaction there. Uh, you know, being delineated by Hermann as, as the Planck scale of oscillation of space that generates the observed properties of particles and atoms, such as m mass and binding forces. Uh, so, you know, one of the, the considerations is just that when you have this strong gravity, quantum gravity, um, you have unification across scale, unification of forces across scale. And so you can have, um, you know, uh, se seemingly very disparate regimes uh, in terms of size or mass uh, actually strongly coupled. And we, we're beginning to see that uh, with the um, way that active galactic nuclei are shaping these extremely large host galaxies. Uh, the struggle for many uh, to comprehend such an intricately interconnected universe stems mainly from the predominant purview in which the fractally nested architecture of organized systems across scale is not yet fully appreciated. So we need to understand that that fractally nested architecture of our universe, which is part, part of the way that uh, you have this strong coupling across scale, unification across scale. Uh, but, you know, this is, it's not fully understood, and it's also admittedly difficult to work with, especially when you're building simulations. Uh, you know, how do you code in all these factors of, uh, you know, influence across scale? Um, you know, it's it's much easier to, to take a, a much more simplified view, but then your output, as many of these recent research papers are showing is uh, incorrect. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a, a hesitancy to tackle such a massively integral 
interconnected model uh you know is present because it, it cannot be easily functionalized in computer simulations where a lot of the analysis uh, especially for you know cosmological scale dynamics has taken place um when it comes to the feedback feed forward processes involving active galactic nuclei it is openly recognized the astrophysicists do not yet understand uh, the process. Uh, so this is very much a, a very active area of uh, investigation. And so it's ripe for uh, the development of new ideas and a better understanding of uh, quantum gravity. Uh, here's the paper uh, that was uh, uh, recently published um, well, uh, the spring of last year on uh, Fermi and Erosita. Uh, bubbles as relics of the past activity of the galaxy's central black hole. Uh, so, you know, it's um, somewhat puzzling. This paper points out that uh, we can see, uh, you know, relatively recently uh, a period of, of active galactic nuclei uh, uh, for our own supermassive black hole uh, producing these massive uh, Fermi bubbles. Uh, and but right now it's uh, relatively quiet. So uh, what switched it on and what's switching it off? Uh, what's regulating this uh, active galactic or AGN feedback dynamics? Uh, so in the uh, RSF article, uh, evidence of black holes forming galaxies is mounting, which I, I showed uh, previously. Um, we discuss how uh, direct observations are showing uh, a black hole in a dwarf galaxy uh, called uh, Heinz 210 uh, is spewing this crest of ionized gas about 500 light years long. Uh, and you, can, you can see it in some, directly in some of the images that's been obtained. Uh, and uh, in this analysis, they conclude that uh, the black hole outflow triggered the star formation uh, within this galaxy. Uh, so, you know, um, that postulate of the supermassive uh, or central black hole uh, directing uh, the rate of new star formation in the galaxy uh, has been, in this case, uh, directly observed in the paper uh, black hole triggered star formation in the dwarf galaxy and needs 210. <laughs> well, let me step back just for one. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, th this is an uh, image of uh, Stefan's uh, quartet. Let's see just real quick. Uh, it's not known what regulates these cycles of AGN and relative quiescence. Um, but the, the role of uh, regulating the rate of new star formation is a key consideration in current attempts to understand the dynamic between the activity and growth of the supermassive black hole uh, at the galactic nucleus and the evolution and development of the host galaxy. Um, as state-of-the-art computer simulations based on current models are not generating the correct observed characteristics of galaxies. As an example of the current lack of predictive power, showing that there is something missing from the conventional understanding. Large elliptical galaxies are observed to be dominated by a population of old fading stars. Uh, that's what I had referred to as the uh, red and dead uh, elliptical galaxies, where it just appears that the uh, AGN feedback dynamics have greatly slowed down. And uh, as a result, the rate of new star formation is largely stopped. Uh, but, you know, they, these are extremely large galaxies, so they might have just been at the end uh, of their, their um, high activity cycles, uh, act, youthful cycles of activity. Uh, yet when computer simulations are run with the relevant factors of the convention model, 
uh, the large elliptical galaxies have stars that start to glow blue. Uh, so it's observed that most stars are red and old, uh, but using conve the uh, conventional model, computer simulations output elliptical galaxies with these huge bright blue stars, directly opposite of what's observed. Uh, it's not in accor accordance with actual observations, but uh, something that uh, is interesting that has occurred is that if you run these computer simulations and you include AGN feedback, feedback dynamics from the supermassive black hole at the center, it outputs the correct results for these elliptical galaxies. They appear, quote, red and dead, unquote. Um, so uh, you know, it's it's um, an example of where uh, to better understand uh, the characteristics and behavior of galaxies, you need the supermassive black hole and you need that AGN feedback process. Um, obviously, uh, uh, feedback from the supermassive black hole at the galactic nucleus uh, is determining the rate of new star formation. The energy input from quasars determines the evolutionary and development tra trajectory of the host galaxy. The challenge in modern cosmology is that it is not currently known what turns active galactic nuclei on and off. What is the regulatory mechanism in this feedback process that determines the extremely high energy epochs and subsequent quiescence of the supermassive black holes? Uh, for example, um, it's been hypothesized that galaxy mergers may be one key catalyst in activating a AGN. So, you know, what's turning on, what's turning off, maybe when galaxies collide, that's the impetus that spurs AGN activity and AGN feedback. Uh, however, recent studies have determined, uh, for instance, with the, the Fermi bubbles, that, that paper we just saw, uh, the corresponding high energy output of the galactic central black hole of our galaxy uh, was not the result of a galaxy merger. Uh, we didn't undergo a galaxy merger 2.6 million years ago. Uh, so what was it that occurred to activate the black hole in such a way? And so here, this is, uh, again, another image from uh, the James Webb Telescope, uh, Stetson's Quintet. Um, and... What we see is uh, the close proximity uh, of this group of galaxies. And this is given some uh, uh, kind of like a ring size seat to galactic mergers and interactions. So a lot of analysis is occurring over this uh, region and uh, this image in particular. Uh, astronomers uh, rarely see uh, in so much detail how interacting galaxies trigger star formation in each other and how the gas in these galaxies is being disturbed as they interact. Uh, so this is kind of like a, a fantastic laboratory for studying these processes fundamental to all galaxies uh, in a level of detail never seen before. Um, and so this image uh, also shows uh, the uh, outflows driven by a supermassive black hole in one of the group's uh, galaxies. Uh, tight galaxy groups like this may have been more common in the early universe when superheated infalling material may have fueled very energetic uh, black holes. Um, so, you, you know, um, a, a major uh, pr uh, prediction from the conventional model is that the, the cycles of high AGN feedback activity, active galactic nuclei activity, uh, is being uh, triggered by these kind of mergers and these kind of uh, interactions. Uh, but, you know, we also have evidence that shows that that's not uh, the case necessarily, because we have evidence of uh, high activity, uh, AGN feedback that is not associated with uh, galactic mergers. So something else is uh, regulating uh, the uh, cycles of uh, AGN feedback and subsequent uh, quiescence. Uh, but uh, this, uh, the, the, the regulation of these cycles uh, can be understood um, from uh, our work. Uh, there's a unified dynamic across scale and an organizational principle that unifies all matter and mass energy interactions, a unified physics. Um,
So uh, one of the, the key is understanding the feed forward feedback dynamics uh, that we've explained uh, that it critically involve uh, the Planck plasma, the pl uh, vacuum energy density, uh, and it's coupling with matter. Uh, and so, you know, understanding that these supermassive black holes, uh, they're in a substantive medium, a Planck plasma. Uh, and, and so um, much of the uh, activity of these supermassive black holes uh, is, uh, and, and, you know, what's triggering uh, their their feedback uh, to the galaxy is uh, informational input from the galaxy galaxy itself through that medium, uh, the Planck plasma medium. Uh, so uh, this um, all strongly suggests that uh, AGN are, are driving. Uh, star rate formation evolution of galaxies. They are the precursor of galaxy formation. Uh, this is supported as well from recent observations of supermassive black holes that reside at the edge of the visible universe and hence are some of the oldest structures in the universe, uh, contradicting what was kind of standard cosmology. Uh, you know, uh, black holes come first. Uh, during the early epochs of the universe when energy densities were extremely large, uh, they then act as the nucleating centers guiding star and galaxy formation. Uh, if astrophysicists had recognized Hermann work early on, there would be no confusion regarding the observations of active galactic nuclei and the importance of AGN feedback on shaping galactic evolution and development. It would be expected that systems obeying the source child condition will be found as the organizational nucleus for organized matter as is clearly delineated in Hermann's scaling law for all organized matter. As well, it would be understood that the most important thing for black hole growth and energy output, the feedback feedforward dynamics, is the hydrodynamic feedback flow of the underlying medium, i.e. Uh, the polarizable Planck field of space-time mass energy information quanta. The linear progression of scale of organized matter in our universe from macro to micro and their apparent coherent relationships supports the structured vacuum hypothesis, leading us to the, the description of its interaction and constraints on an event horizon topological space-time manifold. Through black hole interactions with their surrounding plasma media, vacuum state polarization occurs and produces observable manifestations such as self-coherent collective behaviors. Uh, but uh, in our, our previous publications, it's described uh, how the uh, hydrodynamic feedback processes uh, coupling with the quantum vacuum structure, uh, polarizable structure, uh, uh, regulates the activity of these black holes and certainly the, the supermassive black holes and hence regulates uh, periods of high AGN feedback activity and quiescence. From observational data and our theoretical analysis, we demonstrate that a scaling law can be written for all organized matter utilizing the sparse shield condition, describing cosmological to subatomic structures. Significant observations have led to theoretical and experimental advancements describing systems undergoing gravitational collapse, including vacuum interactions. The universality of this scaling law suggests an underlying polarizable structured vacuum of many white holes, black holes, the uh, micro wormhole network of the unified space memory network. We briefly discussed the manner in which the structured vacuum can be described in terms of resolution of scale analogous to a fractal like scaling as a means of renormalization at the Planck distance. Uh, so um, the, the way that uh, the vacuum plays a role in regulating the activity of the black holes uh, um, has been fully delineated in some of our previous work. Uh, but, you know, uh, right now, uh, kind of in, in conventional uh, astrophysics and modeling, um, it's this huge conundrum. Uh, what's driving galaxies uh, and how are these 
uh, it, it must be the supermassive black holes, but how are they doing it? Uh, what are the dynamics involved? Uh, and the truth is that astrophysicists don't really know how AGN feedback works. Uh, some of the direct quotes from uh, th this article here uh, discussing some of the uh, large outstanding questions about AGN feedback dynamics uh, is uh, we know how important it is, but it's escaping us exactly what causes this feedback. The key problem is that we don't understand feedback deeply physically. Uh, so, you know, this is a very important aspect uh, to understand uh, the feedback feed forward dynamics in a, a fractally nested architecture uh, of uh, organized uh, matter, organized systems uh, in a Planck plasma medium, uh, a hydrodynamic feedback amenable medium. The billion dollar question is, how is the energy coupling to the gas and these uh, active galactic nuclei? And the part in all of this uh, that they're missing to couple the energy to the gas is the hydrodynamic feedback flow of the underlying medium, i.e. Uh, the Planck field. Um, and so in some of um, our earliest publications, we were discussing uh, this feedback feed forward dynamics, this hydrodynamic flow, this dual torus like uh, topology of black holes uh, interacting with uh, the um, uh, Planck field uh, and how this is the, uh, uh, the organizational parameter for all organized matter, all systems, all organized systems in the universe. Uh, Hermain's theory predicts that matter production and star formation result from spin dynamics in the vacuum structure near the horizons of black holes. The spin dynamics result from the inclusion of torque and Coriolis forces in Einstein's field equations and the Kern-Newman solution for black holes, uh, what's termed uh, the hermain rauscher solution, which describes the dynamical rotational structure of galaxies, nova, supernova, and other astrophysical structures such as uh, th that are driven by space-time torque, which also is responsible uh, for the observed formation of the uh, spiral structure in galaxies, uh, when you're talking about spiral galaxies. The model is consistent with galactic structures having a supermassive black hole at their centers, as well as polar jets, accretion disks, spiral, arm, spiral arms, galactic halo formations, and the wind or outflow coming out from black holes, uh, triggering uh, um, AG and feedback, and uh, as we saw, um, uh, regulating the rate of new star formation in galaxies, among other things. Uh, so, you know, this uh, is a topological representation of the hermain rauscher solution, uh, resulting from the addition of torque and Coriolis forces, uh, uh, torque and Coriolis Coriolis terms is an amendment to Einstein's field equations, uh, where the usual uh, Minkowski space is replaced by a double torus. We see here, uh, the solution provides new features for the black hole structure and behavior where a double torus dynamic becomes a primary agent to explain the energy mass and information flow in the system. So this is one of the key pieces that are missing uh, that, that would help astrophysicists understand what it is uh, they are observing. Uh, Hermain's discovery that the ordering dynamics of physical systems across scale are systems that obey the Schwarzschild condition uh, to Einstein's field, the solution to Einstein's field equations uh, is congruent with the now unavoidable fact that black holes must be the key piece of the puzzle for achieving solutions in quantum gravity, uh, unified physics model, and unification across scale uh, because uh, black holes are massive and very dense gravitational and so hence they're relativistic objects presenting at the same time extreme quantum effects so they're also quantum objects uh, therefore black holes are the natural bridge between general relativity and quantum mechanics uh, or between a continuous picture and a discretized or granular picture of consciousness uh, of um of uh, um, space-time. 
which we also discuss as being linked to uh, consciousness and, and sentience, sentient type behavior. And the intelligence of systems uh, is involved with this feedback feed forward dynamic. Uh, so uh, thank you all for um, uh, uh, participating in uh, the Unified Science Review uh, for today. Um, and uh, I'd be happy uh, to um, continue some of the discussion here. I, I have uh, a good uh, um, 10, 15 minutes uh, before I need to.